She's the latest um, yeah, uh, Partners in Education Research uh, Seminar. Today we have Phil Levine, who is the Catherine Coleman and A. Barton Hepburn Professor of um, Economics at Wellesley College. Um, Phil has uh, spent much of his career focused on the uh, drivers of teen motherhood and trends in uh, teen motherhood over time. But as in the last five or six years, has become interested in uh, the effect of college pricing on uh, students' decisions, in, in particular um, on how there's so much uncertainty about um, the price students will actually pay as distinct from uh, the sticker price. And to what extent um, the net price and the tuition price actually is, um, is driving uh, student behavior. So uh, thank you, uh, Bill, and welcome to Larson Hall. <laughs> Happy to be here today. Uh, just a couple of preliminary announcements. I should want to say that this is joint work with Jennifer Ma uh, at the College Board and uh, Lauren Russell at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the other preliminary announcement that I want to say is that like, I have a little conflict of interest in this paper, sort of a minor one, I would say, in the sense that um, I am the uh, founder and CEO of a nonprofit corporation called My Intuition Corp. Um, which is designed to help sort of overcome the problem of sticker shock, so which is what the paper is about. Um, ooh, oh, sorry. But it's a nonprofit corporation. My co-authors have nothing to do with it, so basically I think I'm good. <laughs> I'm just going to go from there. I'm going to make sure you're aware of that. Okay, so let's get started on some motivation here. Uh, it turns out that at a lot of colleges and universities in the United States, including state flagships, which is what this paper is mostly going to be or exclusively going to be about. Um, enrollments by socioeconomic status is not exactly proportional. So I have here an example from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, I don't mean to be picking on the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. It's the same at many other schools. It's just that that's where we live. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. But here's some, so the statistics are that 46% of students at Amherst uh, come from the top 20% of the income distribution. Uh, and only 5.8% of the students come from the bottom 20% of the income distribution. So that's a little off. And so, well, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem for a lot of reasons, but one of which is because uh, a college education is a great way to sort of jumpstart economic mobility. So if you're at the bottom of the distribution and you go to a good school, you're really going to jump up a lot. So here's this, these statistics sort of uh, uh, provide some documentation of that. So here what this graph shows is that if you start at the 10th percentile of the income distribution, uh, just on average for all children, uh, you're likely to end up at, you know, on average at about the 35th percentile of the income distribution. If you go to, you know, forgetting about IV Plus, uh, you know, the really fancy private schools, you know, a selective public school is a selective just means, um, you know, doesn't accept everybody. So UMass is going to be higher than that. To go to a state flagship, let's say it's like another elite. I'm not sure exactly where it fits in this picture, but something like that. If you're born in the 10th percentile and you go to one of those schools, you end up in the 70th percentile. And not only do you jump up a lot, but it turns out that relative to kids who start start off at the top of the income distribution, you're not that much further behind, right? So if you start off at the 90th percentile, you'd be at, you know, let's say the, whatever, the 72nd or 75th percentile. If you, if you started off at the 10th, you're at the 70th percentile, like way equalizing. So the ability of college to be able to get people to rise up is really significant. And so that's an important thing. So the question is then, um, uh, why doesn't that happen? So you could imagine that perhaps by the time they get to college, in some sense it's too late. 
so you know, kids at younger ages, basically kids at younger ages have different economic, uh, academic opportunities. Um, and if you can tend to come from a wealthier community, for instance, you have better educational opportunities, you go to better schools, and there's you know, very strong, strong correlations like that. Um, and by the time you get to college, it may be too late. Maybe like you're not really qualified to go to, a, to, to elite colleges. Um, except while that plausibly could be true, it turns out not to be true. Uh, and so, uh, I don't know if Chris Avery is here, but I think he was not unable to come. Um, but you know, this is a famous Hawksby and Avery paper that many of you probably know about that shows that there's this tremendous problem of undermatching. So in the data, what we see is that, so what these data show is that if we just select a group of students who have like, good SA, high SAT scores, they're sort of qualified to be able to, to attend good schools, um, and split them up into high income and low income students, they apply to very different types of schools. Okay? So for the lower income groups, these are all high SAT students. So basically, like, again, they sh they're, they're all well qualified. You know, for the higher income students, they all apply to sort of schools that sort of, you know, what this metric is a little bit complicated, but the schools that sort of match their academic ability. So zero means basically, you know, your SAT scores, scores are exactly the same as the average SAT score at that institution. Um, so these schools kind of represent the, 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 what we sort of recommend students should be thinking about. Apply to uh, some best fits, some match schools, some reach schools, and some safety schools. And so for the most part, that's what the wealthier kids do. Um, perhaps a little bit overly conservative on the downward side, but like, you know, whatever. Um, and really, so very few of them apply. So a non-selective school is like a community college, right? And so very few of them, you can imagine circumstances in a kid's life where maybe going to a community college, staying close to home, whatever, makes sense. Um, and so some of them do that, and that's fine. The low-income kids don't do that. The low-income low, low kids, over almost half of them, are applying to the non-selective schools. And this is among the group of the high income, the high SAT score kids. Okay. This is a problem. They're not going to the schools that are right for them. Something about their income status leads them to a position where they're not applying to schools that are right for them. That's a problem. Which leads to the next question, why is that? And so certainly there could be lots of arguments for why that could be, but one of them could be misinformation about pricing. So what I have here is a, is a few slides that just sort of indicate, just from like public opinion polls and surveys and things like that, like what do people know? And so here is an article from CNBC about a, um, a government survey. It says only 11% of ninth graders correctly estimated the tuition and fees for one year at a public four-year college in the state. So, you know, 11% is not like a particularly big number. Um, that's a problem. Here's a different one. Um, more than half of students, 54%, indicated that they looked at college costs based on the total cost of attendance without taking financial aid into account. So if you're not taking into fi financial aid into account, you're only focused on what I'm going to call the sticker price. The sticker price is like the number on the web page that says, like, what's the cost of attendance. It's basically the maximum that you can pay. And so if the only thing that you know is the maximum that you can pay, like, that's a lot more than what a lot of people are going to have to pay. Um, taking financial aid into account is, like, is a big deal. And that's really going to show you what you actually have to pay. Here's a third survey. This is from a, a marketing survey. Um, uh, so the question reads, in the course of evaluating colleges, did you reject any colleges on the basis of their published sticker price alone? And, you know, it's sort of remarkable that, you know, if, if you look at these data, um, you know, the, for public institutions, 44% say yes. At a public institution. Do we know what the misperception of prices are for guidance counselors and teachers? Uh, my guess is it's not a lot different than this. So I don't see any have any survey evidence along those lines. Um, but anecdotally, <laughs> I can tell you that mostly I, uh, you know, I worry about that as well. Um, and so getting, which is consistent with what I'm worried about. Like, how do you get the message across to the students that like what they're going to have to pay is not the sticker price? Okay. Um, so 
So again, this is a lot of evidence that we have this problem here. The people are making decisions about college without actually knowing what they're going to have to pay. Do you know what the probability of paying the sticker price is? For, I mean, you've broken down colleges in various ways, but anyway. I mean, it's obviously it's going to scan, uh, uh, depend on school to school. But like, you know, ballpark half. Right? Um, think about it this well, So actually, let's come back to that in a few minutes, and I'll be able to sort of better answer that question. But like, you know, half would be a good number. Half, yeah. Half of students enrolled. Uh, but probably a large, uh, actually a, a much larger fraction of the population. I'm going to come back to that later. Okay. So this is the problem that we face. So basically, this is I want to talk. I want to define a, a concept called sticker shock, which I've defined here to be occurs when students are discouraged from applying to schools because of the high sticker price, ignoring the potential avail availability of financial aid. Okay. Sticker shock is a potential problem. If you experience sticker shock and you're making decisions on the basis of some much larger number than you end up going to, have, going to have to be able to pay. If you think about it, even a public institution worth you know, $30,000 ballpark is the right number. $30,000 is a lot of money. Right? If you're making $50,000 a year, you're not paying $30,000 um, for your kid to go to college. And if that's what you think it is, game over. So what do we know about sticker shock and its role in influencing people's decisions. Well, um, it turns out that, in some sense, we know stuff about sticker shock, but we only know stuff about sticker shock sort of indirectly. So people have been worried about this problem for quite some time, even to the point where people have proposed interventions to get students to overcome sticker shock, assuming that it exists. So these are a few examples of the things that you know, many of you probably know about. There was the H&R Block. Uh, these are all random assignment experiments. Um, and so there was the H&R Block intervention where the people would go in and get their taxes done. And then they would get information back on what um, uh, you know, their eligibility for FAFSA and things like that. So basically their federal uh, financial aid eligibility, along with getting assistance and sort of you know, making it through the application process. Big effects. Right? Very successful intervention. Um, expanding college opportunities. Uh, was Bridget here? No, Bridget. Yeah. She would be involved. Anyways. <laughs> um, expanding college opportunities is, an, is another one. Um, Hoxby and Turner, where, you know, ran it from using um, college board databases and high achieving students, um, randomized mailings. Uh, to high achieving students, telling them what the schools that they can, uh, can you know, uh, reasonably expect to get into, along with what it's actually going to cost them based on their, the, the income in their zip code. Um, you know, trying to forecast a financial aid award, random assignment, treatment control, blah, 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 big effect. Okay? I should also caution you that there's been a subsequent follow up to that where sort of taking it to scale didn't work quite as well, but that's not my problem for today. <laughs> so make sure you know that I know that that's there. Um, and then the third one is this much more recent Hale Scholarship experiment that took place in Michigan. So in Michigan, um, uh, students or schools or students were randomly assigned? Schools? Schools. Schools. Schools were random. I think schools were randomly assigned. And if you attended one of the schools, uh, that was in the treatment group, you would get these very colorful, look just like this, <laughs> things show up in your mail um, called the HAL Scholarship that said that if you made under $60,000 a year, the University of Michigan would be tuition free. And that's important. Not cost, total free cost of attendance, tuition free. So instead of the you know, ballpark, instead of the $30,000, no more than $15,000. Okay. The most important thing for the purposes of this discussion and that experiment is that those students would have all been eligible for that same level of financial aid anyways. It did not change their financial aid eligibility. All it did was communicate with the word free the message that college is going to be cheaper than they think. So Phil, like the, the, what's interesting about the tuition free promise is that there the subsequent information 
probably increases the cost for people because they think, oh, like you weren't including room and board um, <laughs> yeah. and you weren't including books. But the way we typically do it yeah. is, it, so like we try lure, I mean, what the Hale Scholarship did was lure people in, provided the somewhat bad news is like there are some other fees that you're going to have to pay, but that's after you've applied. Right. The way we usually do it is, no, there's lots of good news. Like once you've yeah. gotten in, you're going to get yeah. this a lot yeah, of financial yeah, yeah, aid. Yeah, yeah. But the problem is, we're if the decision to apply in the first place is driven by, right. you know, what you know before you apply, that's just bad news if, in the case of tuition. Yeah. Whereas in the hail, it sort of flipped it and said like, no, well, maybe we'll provide some additional information later, but we'll make it sound awesome at the beginning. Exactly, it's 100% about the marketing. Yeah. Right, so basically this is a marketing message that's trying to communicate um, uh, the point that college is affordable for you. And then, you know, at the end, you may find out that, like, maybe. <laughs> well, but it's in time, like, you. It's afterwards. Yeah. And, and it's not, um, like, malfeasance. It's, it's not, uh, deceiving kids because eventually they'll know the price before they actually have to decide where to enroll. Right. But it's, it's putting the, it, it's saying, okay, we, we don't, let's not share the worst possible information up front, which is what we're typically doing, yeah. because that's when people are deciding where to even apply. Yeah. Right. So at the application stage is, is what you're talking about, um, is that the target of this intervention. And essentially what it's showing is that the marketing works, like getting people over the the cost threshold of thinking that it's going to be really expensive and you know communicating to them that it's going to be less it's free worked. What I think is interesting about all of those experiments is sometimes sticker shock has to exist for those experiments to have been successful. Right? It has to be the case that people thought college was more expensive than what you were telling them that it was. But it's also an indirect so it's not so while that has to be true, it's a very indirect way of identifying sticker shock. So, I mean, there's the one difference is H and R Block. Also, it, it wasn't just they resolved the uncertainty; it was that they did some of the work for you. Yeah, like yeah. like they would, and so yeah. it could have been that kids were perfectly aware that if they filed. The paperwork they would have gotten this thing gotten the financially there could have been no uncertainty about the aid but they just didn't want to go through the process right i mean so it's conceivable that at least for that particular experiment it, it you know we can't untangle those two things yeah. um but you know for the purpose with of the hail i think it's a cleaner story for hail yeah marketing Right. So the point is that the, those are these are all indirect tests of sticker shock hypothesis. For them to work, it had to be the case that sticker shock was affecting people's decision making. The marketing undid it, and it worked. Um, that's not what I want to do in this paper. So in some sense, I would argue that the contribution of this paper is that it's similar in the sense that sticker shock is clearly the focus. But I want to actually directly attack the question. I want to directly address. Do we observe people responding to prices that aren't right? <laughs> um, that's sort of the point of this paper. So basically, if you have a student and you tell them a price and that price isn't right, are they responding to the wrong price? That would be sort of what I'm going to call a direct test of sticker shock. Okay. Um, yeah. What's going to be interpretation of people responding to that? Like, are you going to? argue that they're being irrational or in that or, or alternatively are you going to argue that in a sense the sticker price is a signal of some other part to observe attributes about the school that they may actually want to rationally sort on? Um, well because we're going to be looking at changes in prices so in some sense all of the aspects of the school hasn't ch have not changed so if you increase the price for instance are they going to apply less? Let's take an example like 
tools, obviously, you should let you know that the sticker price shop is there. So the thing that a bit shocking is the fact that schools aren't advertising the average expected cost to go there, right? So in some sense, like if you're going to take a very dim view of it, you can say that really schools want to use this as a way to screen out poor kids. And in a sense, like if you look at like a high sticker price, and if you know an expectation that that's going to screen out poor kids, then you know as a parent that you're more likely to have like a, a richer set of peers going to the school. And you might actually like some of the demand response might really be the sticker price is like a signal of like these are the harder to measure attributes of quality as opposed to like an irrational response. Okay, that's not how I, I'm on board with that. That's not how okay. I'm going to interpret it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I, okay. It, it's conceivable that that's what's happening. Okay. <laughs> or are institutions trying to signal quality with their price? Like yeah. they're not trying to scare away low-income kids maybe that's a byproduct I mean, of them like trying to trying to say so i think that um uh what's relevant here is that also all of these things are true sort of in steady state and like in is a fixed effect kind of framework but in terms of a change i think it's less likely to be true it could be that a school is signaling something about greater quality but like a change in quality and that's fine but if we talk about the price variation i think it will be clear that's probably not what's happening yeah. I mean, this is only important in so far as like how you want to pitch the paper, right? Because you pitch the paper as they're making a mistake and they're being irrational, or in fact, this the sticker price is really allowing for sorting to happen on some like attributes that are shrouded. Okay, so that that's more about like how you want to pitch. Okay, let's talk about this at dinner. <laughs> um, all right. So what's the price? Basically, we need an experiment. So what's the pricing experiment that we want to incorporate? Um, that can sort of get at this, this question. So this actually, you know, it was funny that this came out. This is October 23rd, so like, I don't know, whatever, 10 days or so ago, or it's a couple weeks ago. Um, I was so happy when I saw this article. It's like, oh, how nice of the, um, the New York Times to publish something so useful for me right now. <laughs> I don't know James Cavall or anything, but like it, uh, it was a favor for me. This is an opinion piece. So he was actually, this is about free college. He didn't actually, wasn't about my paper, if you can believe that. Um, <laughs> but, so this is about free college, and he's trying to make the argument that, like, you know, whatever you think about free college, and however much it costs, you know, God forbid there's going to be a recession, then you guys are really in trouble. Like, whatever you were expecting it to cost normally in the presence of a recession, it's going to be a lot more expensive than that. Um, and that's a potential problem in the free college argument. I don't want to have the free college argument. I don't have a horse in, this, in that race at the moment. Um, that we can talk about at dinner too. Um, but so you'll see the dot, 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 because this is further down in the article. So I was doing a good job of reading it. So take our reason. In 2009, the economy was in free fall. Uh, state revenues plummeted along with the market. Forced to balance their budget, states made deep cuts to community colleges and public universities. In California alone, funding for private universities fell by more than a billion dollars. Like, yes. <laughs> so basically, that's my education strategy. Right. So you have this recession. This recession comes along. It just like states were just massively increasing tuition to, to, to um, shore up their budget deficits at the time. If the state wasn't going to pay the bill, the school still has to run. Just get the money a different way. So here's. Um, a CNN article from, you know, right at the time this was happening in 2009. University of California students uh, protest 32% tuition increase. So that's front and center, 32% tuition increase. Note, by the way, they don't look happy. <laughs> Do those look like happy students? No. There's an armed guard <laughs> in the picture. Okay. He doesn't so, look happy. Either. He doesn't. How would you feel? <laughs> um, this is a problem. So you got the University of California increasing tuition 32%. And notice, by the way, and this is relevant because we're going to come back to this later, the 32% tuition increase. Right? When we talk about the cost of college, usually that's not what we mean. We usually think cost of attendance, inclu including all of the room and board expenses, blah, blah, blah. Right? That's not what got publicized. What got publicized is tuition increase, dramatic tuition increase. Okay. Um, California wasn't alone. So for example, the University of Nevada, Florida, and Washington, each estimate that tuitions will jump 10 to 15% a year. 
This is a link from 2010. Um, blah, blah, blah. University of Washington expects to raise rates 14% to, make it help, to help make up for a 21 million cut in funding. If you think about it, what we have here is the equivalent of a random shock that increases tuition prices at different schools at different rates depending on their state economic conditions. Right? The states that got clobbered the worst in the recession are going to be the ones that have the greatest impact on their budgets that need to pass along greater price increases. Okay. So that's going to generate a way to get at the sticker shock hypothesis. So I have this little, you know, what you see in the kind of metric, you know, or undergraduate kind of metric class or something, to, you know, to sort of highlight a diff and diff sort of model. Um, the institutional feature that's important here is this notion that some schools meet full need and some schools don't. So um, my guess is most of you understand this, but um, uh, just for completeness, um, a school that has a meet full need tuition policy is one um, in which the, they do sort of using FAFSA or the CSS profile, a calculation gets done of what, of what they think you can afford, quote unquote, and that's what you pay. So whatever the calculation is that's, um, that says what you can afford, you get paid that you get charged that amount, no matter what. So you know again if for UMass, well UMass is not. So Berkeley, for instance, is a meetful needs school um, for for California residents. So if you're a resident of California, apply to Berkeley, and they do the calculation. It says you can afford ten thousand dollars. It doesn't matter if tuition if cost of attendance is $30,000 or $100,000, you pay $10,000, okay? At not meaningful needs schools, that's not true. Tuition goes up 32%, your tuition's going up 32%. Okay. So, that is, so we have a distinction between states that meet full need and states that don't. The four that I'm going to focus on that meet full need during this time period is uh, Berkeley, Michigan, Chapel Hill, and UVA. Those four schools all um, uh, met full, uh, full financial need during this period. And then you can think about distinguishing people by income, and the income you'll notice is in quotation marks. So it's not really income, but like it's simple enough for now. We'll come back and do the details later. Um, we take the high income people and the low income people, and then we can think about, so who is actually affected by this price increase? Um, if you're a high income person, 100%, doesn't matter what kind of school you're in, you're not getting financial aid. So if there's a 32% price increase, you pay 32% more. Um, if you're a low-income person, now it matters. So if you're a low-income person at a not meet full need school, you, your price goes up. You pay the full price of the, the you get it gets passed, all of that price increase gets passed along to you. If you're not at a meet full need, if you're at a meet full need school, you don't have to pay it. So at a meet full need, school, if you're low income and tuition goes up, it doesn't affect you. And that sets up our quasi-experiment. So in the states that increase tuition by more, we're looking for pattern. So if students are responding rationally, and I know that they have a different interpretation, but if students are responding rationally to the price changes, these guys shouldn't do anything. So if you're low income in California, it shouldn't have affected your application behavior at all. Everybody else should be affected. And to the extent that there's a downward sloping demand curve um, in terms of applications, you know, price goes up, demand goes down. Okay? So we're looking for a decrease in applications among these groups and not for that group. That would indicate rationality. If that's not what you see, um, that's indicative of sticker shock. So, um, so just to give you sort of a, an, an overview of uh, technically what we're going to do in this paper. So some of this I've sort of already described, but just to be clear. In terms of the approach, so we're going to think about the recession as providing exogenous variation in pricing. And um, uh, states raise their tuition across the board, across all state, uh, state flagship institutions increased their tuition across the board because all the states had budget shortfalls. Um, some worse than others, the worse the budget shortfall, the bigger the tuition increase. Um, and so that's going to start the process. 
There's also, though, this, so, you know, using a recession as a, ra as a random experiment has flaws to it in the sense that, like, other things are going on during a recession. Like, maybe the reason why you're not going to college is because your parents lost their jobs and they can't pay for college. Right? That would be a problem. Um, so what we do to correct for that is we're going to control for labor market conditions at sort of the local level, which will be counties. The state budget problems are about states. So how well is the state doing? So in some sense, the relative frame of reference is you know, holding constant the local economic conditions that affect your ability to pay because of the recession. What's going on at the state level is the state has, states have different budget shortfalls. And then we just basically want to, you know, in some ways, you, you can think about this picture, interacting this. Uh, so you, there's the diff and diffs. There's two differences. And then you need tuition changes as what's sort of like a third difference. And at the end of the day, um, you know, so I said embed quasi-experiment in this framework. Really what we're doing is sort of setting up the equivalent of like a triple difference, where the third difference is the, the, uh, the tuition changes that vary across the school. Okay? Uh, the data that we're going to use for this, so applications are going to be our main outcome. We don't actually have applications for every student from every school. What we do have um, that we're using instead are SAT scores. Um, being sent. So if you sent your score, so we have data from the College Board. The College Board provided all the data um, for this part of the p uh, paper. So we have individual records um, for every student between 2007 and 2013 who is in the College Board system, which virtually is everybody. Um, uh, and then we have data for all of those students. Did they send their SAT score to a particular, did they send their SAT scores to Berkeley? Okay. And then there's the issue of us, not everyone takes SATs. We'll talk about that later. So, like, the labor market conditions, um, like, there, there's, there's the ability to pay effect, which actually, um, if, if there were a functioning capital market, like, if I could borrow, it's based purely on the tuition and net price, local labor market conditions shouldn't matter. Except for the low income folks, maybe who don't have access to capital markets. Okay. And, but both the, um, both high income and low income kids are, should also be considering foregone earnings. So like, so during a recession, there's there's also a reduction in foregone earnings from yeah. going to going to school. Yeah. So, but I think that the key thing is the the effect of labor market conditions will be different for high versus low income. For high income folks, it's just the foregone earnings. For low income folks, it is the foregone earnings and the, you know, the um, credit constraints, the, the, late, the ability to pay. Okay, so in some sense, like the um, second differences will take care of those, no? In some sense, it's, it's the identification. So I, guess, the I, guess, I guess what I'm arguing for is like, and maybe you do this, is, is like allowing the labor market conditions oh. to have a different effect for high versus We didn't do that, but that's certainly something we could try. Um, okay, so that's the first thing we're doing. The, the focus of the paper is at the application stage, um, but it would also be interesting to look at what happened. What happened? Oh, the other thing which I forgot to say is, you know, I think that and we'll talk about this more in detail when we get to sort of methodology. You know, I think that's a, that's a pretty good identification strategy. Um, just to sort of go really one step further, uh, we also e estimate IV models, where basically we're going to instrument the tuition with the state unemployment rate directly. And something that's really super focusing on the state budget crisis, um, in case there was something else going on that might be go in, might be determining state uh, state tuition levels. Um, it's not obvious to me what those things are, but if they're there, like instrumenting with the unemployment rate, since the unemployment rate is going to be very strongly tied to the state budget problems, it gives you, you know, sort of more narrowly defined identification just on the budget crisis aspect of it. 
Although that's not ideal because yeah. you'd expect if it is driving, if it is driving price and ability to pay, it may have its own direct effect on yeah. on um, on the outcome. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the ID models and the results when we get there, but like it doesn't matter if we use ID or OLS. So <laughs> um, I think that's sort of an important. That definitely helps. Uh, okay, and so we also want to use data on enrollments because we want to see like where the kids end up in the end. Um, and so to do that, we have this, the College Board database. The College Board database can be matched by them to data from the National Student Clearinghouse. So basically, the same kids for whom we have their uh, uh, score set data, we also have where they uh, enrolled. Okay. Um, so what do we find? So basically, we get uh, everybody, the, it turns out the man curve sloped down um, in general, and it turns out that everybody responds in exactly the same way. Um, so you'll see that applications go down. They go down for the high income kids, the low income kids, the needful need, the not, uh, whole thing, that matrix that we showed before, everybody responds exactly the same way. Um, and that's uh, evidence of the sticker shock. Um, when we go on to think about enrollment, then at that point, like, if, you, if you have to, it's not, you know, we test for differences in enrollment patterns across the different groups, but if you don't see differences in application patterns, probably not going to see differences in enrollment patterns. So we're so not really going to focus on that. But in terms of, in general, what happens to enrollment, um, we don't see that being affected really at all with the state flagship institutions. And the reason why we think that is, and we'll, we'll, we'll show, provide evidence is, uh, of, is that Flagships have plenty of applications. They don't have to worry about filling seats. If they get fewer applications, they can just change the cutoff on who gets in. Do you look at students' number of overall applications? Like, are they reducing applications to these schools specifically, or applying to fewer schools? Yeah, we did that. I don't remember the answer. <laughs> we definitely did look at that at one point. Um, yeah, I don't remember. Um, OK. I'll have to, if you send me an email, I, I promise I will get back to you on that one. Okay, so basically that's the overview of what we do in the paper. So now we can go in a little bit um, more in depth. So let's talk a little bit on institutional detail. So I just want to extend sort of that, the, the two-way table to sort of be a little bit more precise about what we mean and what's going on in the table. Um, so that income was in quotation marks because financial aid isn't based on income. Financial aid is based on this other thing called expected family contribution. So expected family contribution is the number that's calculated that says what you can quote unquote afford. Okay. So um, <coughs> for most of these schools at the state flagships, um, expected family contribution is calculated through FAFSA and FM. Uh, for a few of these schools, Michigan and Virginia, I think are the only ones, uh, they use profile to calculate expected family contribution. Either way, there's, you, know, you put in like a million pieces of information under the profile or under the FM. It goes through the magic box and a number comes out that says what you can afford. That's how financial, so EFC is how, you, is how financial aid is actually calculated, not based on income. Okay? So um, based on EFC calculation, in some sense, like you don't need financial aid if the expected family contribution is above the sticker price. So we, have, we can break down people into aid eligible and aid ineligible based on their EFC. Um, we don't have EFCs for all of these people. So we need to proxy EFCs for all of these people. And in particular, we're not going to proxy the, the continuous measure. We're going to proxy whether you're eligible or ineligible for aid. And so how are we going to do that? We actually we tried several different ways of doing this. I'll talk about this one now, and we can talk about some of the other things that we tried later. Um, but it turns out that you're eligible for aid. Somebody asked. Uh, I think you asked. You're eligible for aid. At a state, at a thirty thousand dollars state flagship institution, at you know roughly between a hundred and hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars of family income, um, assuming that you have sort of typical assets that come like with that. So if you have a million dollar trust fund, that's not right. But like if you have the normal assets that come along with that, average assets that come along with that, that's roughly the range in which you're eligible. Okay, so you know hundred to one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars is going to put you you know. 80% of the population is eligible for financial aid, ballpark. Um, 
So annual income below one hundred to one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. So how are we going to pass it? So we actually we have zip code level median income because we have the zip codes from the College Board data, and if the median level the median income level in your zip code is below seventy-five thousand dollars, we assume you're eligible for aid. Okay. And that we find that around so ninety percent of families in these zip in these zip codes have annual incomes below the one hundred twenty-five thousand dollar number. So almost, you know, so virtually everybody using this definition in our eight eligible sample is eligible for financial aid. So when, when these prices go up, in a sense, like people, they're going to be some people who previously were in for Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're not going to become more. Yeah, a little bit. They're going to be eligible. Yeah. Are you, are you going to show us some results in terms of like the price sensitivities for those folks who go from being in for marginal to being marginal? No, I mean, if you think about like, you know, um, the income range that's going to make you marginal is like that, and the income distribution, you know, is from let's say I'm just making this number up, but I think it's probably not that far off. Between 125 and 130 thousand dollars, let's say those are the marginal kids, because you're right, there are marginal kids. The income distribution in that part, the the, the thickness of the income distribution in that range is so narrow. It's the universe, right? Yeah. So I mean, like, you should have power to be able to distinguish that. And I think that that's well, I don't have the individual's income. I just have the zip code level income. And so we've experimented with different cutoffs. But so seventy-five thousand dollars is the magic number here. We tried different things here, and basically the results stay the same. We don't have the ability to do what you're saying to see the marginal kids. That requires too much precision on on finances that we but, don't have. But but I think Peter's saying like maybe if you could you identify kids who you know have incomes that are so high they can't possibly be marginal. And don't you have like like so like if you if you take the the um, Yeah, we have done some experimentation with sort of this is a, a yes or no above or below. And you know we sort of tried like having three groups with like below 75 75 to 100, above 100, or something like yeah. that. And you start getting, like, the, the cells start getting small enough that it starts getting mushy. Right, but I, I, it's the idea is if you leave out that middle group, maybe you can just ignore it. You don't know what the middle group is. Yeah, we can't tell exactly. When they he doesn't know what the middle group is. In the essence, when they ask you questions, I remember that they would ask you questions about your parents' earnings yeah. when you fill out the forms, too. So, like, would that be, like, more precise than even the Z measure? Wait, so, um, like when you film the SAT, like you do some demographic stuff, and I do believe that they have some information that asks you about your family income. That's sufficient. On the College Board database? I'm trying to remember like the exact data that we have, and I'm blanking on that. But I mean, the fact that we're doing this sort of thing, we, we don't have, so if we have exact um, EFCs, like some, well, you don't get the EFC until at, like after they apply. Okay. So, anyway, I don't think we have those. Okay. I was just, so Emmerich was saying we don't know. Well, I, I think we do know the folks who would not be receiving a penny of additional aid who would be facing 100% of the, the price increase. If your income is above a certain level, if, if your income is very high, there is there is no tuition increase that will yield yeah. any increase in your in your aid. Yeah. And and I think we could identify that group potentially based on maybe their zip code. Sure. Well, we've actually, so we've tried doing something. I mean, in the end of the day, what we have now is a treatment like that bottom cell. Like, we've done a really good job of, of measuring this group. To the extent that the other groups, like in the, in the ineligible group, there's going to be some eligibles in the ineligible group. And so in some sense, for those groups, we're dampening any effect that we might be observing. But like at the end of the day, zero here is what I'm looking for. Right? And this group is zero. Like I'm really very highly confident that like it should be zero for these people. And so if I get you know, an elasticity of 0.5 for the others, maybe it should have been 0.8. But that's not really what I care about. So they, so they do ask this question about family income on your college board. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so the question is what's in the data, but I got to move on. Okay, here's some. So here's again some institutional detail. Here's some facts about what states do. So this is, by the way, this is fall 2019. 
this is current. So this is not with, during our sample period. But just to give you a sense of like what states charge, this is a table of uh, unmet financially financial needs. So bas uh, basically, if they don't meet full need, there's a gap between what they're expecting you to pay and what you can what the EFC says you can afford. Okay, that's what these numbers are. And so you'll notice that you know California meets full need zero. Okay. The other states I'll come back to in a minute, but Michigan, North Carolina, Virginia are all at zero. They meet full need. Okay? But these are the, the exceptions. Most states affect, expect you to pay something beyond what you can afford. So in Massachusetts, um, so in Massachusetts, it's about eight thousand dollars of unmet need. And this, so the, the blue line and the orange line is based on some schools give merit aid. So if you're a meritorious student, it's going to be cheaper for you. And the blue, so that's the blue line. Um, and you'll see the blue lines are less. If, if you're the 25th percentile of the school's distribution, you're probably not getting merit aid. Um, so the orange lines, is not, in some sense, is the financial aid based part of the problem. Right. If you get to like out here, Alabama, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, basically there's no state aid. So if you think about you can you know whatever the tuition is thirty thousand dollars whatever subtract off um, a Pell Grant subtract off self help the work study and the loan at those schools that's all federal money right? at the end at those schools that's it like there's really nothing else um, and so at those schools you're talking about like you know fifteen thousand dollars or something of unmet need um, and then obviously there's the range in between. Okay. So these other states, so we've got the four states that I'm talking about is being, that I'm going to focus on, California, Michigan, North Carolina, and Virginia. Uh, let's see if I can remember these correctly. So Delaware introduced meet full needs status. At, uh, in the middle of our sample period, we end up throwing them out. Um, Illinois now has a policy of meeting full need for students under $60,000 or something like that. Now, but not then. Um, uh, Washington. Uh, I'm not remember. So Wisconsin also has, like Illinois, they just adopted something for low-income kids. And Wyoming is just so cheap <laughs> that for low-income kids, like it doesn't, like for higher-income kids, they wouldn't be meeting full need. It's just like, yeah. Um, so during our sample period, that's how we're left off with uh, the four states as being our treatment group states. Okay. Here's data on the annual tuition increases. You know, almost 10% on average uh, in. 2009-10, it's got to be the year after the recession started because that's the lag when the, there's no money coming in, so they need to catch up. Are they increasing in-state and out-of-state tuition? More? This is all in-state. Yeah, so basically everything I'm going to be doing is for state in-state residents, so um, they could be doing other things for out-of-state. <laughs> Can you talk to the timing of when they announce these and how that relates to when students are taking the SAT, right? If many students are taking it junior year, when are they announcing tuition and... How's that affecting you? Yeah, we spent so much time thinking about the exact timing of when these things occur. There's actually an appendix in the paper that details all of this. So basically, like from you know when the typical announcement dates of tuition, it's all mapped out. So sort of basically, what we have is one lag back gets you um, the unemployment rate to the um, to the tuition, and then one lag further from the tuition to the tuition being set to when the kid applied. And that works out the best in the data. How do you think about what's happening with international students? Yeah, they're not in here. It's only state residents. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so are you thinking about supplies being fixed at these schools? Are you thinking about supplies as endogenously like responding to the economic conditions? So, like overall supply of slot at the school? Uh, so slots, constant. So here is um, a graph that shows sort of like changes in tuition um, across these schools, distinguishing sort of the bad recession states and the not bad recession states, so which like still is a lot, right? So the, um, the orange states are the states where the state where the recession was worse, the unemployment rate jumped by more than five percent. The blue states, the blue lines are the states where the unemployment rate increased by less than five percent. So it's still a lot, but you know, not as much. And so tuition went up more. Um, and so in the IV thing, the first stage regression works very well. Here's an interesting one. So if you break up states by meet full need and doesn't meet full need, you know, for all, pre you know, about the same, about the same, about the same. And this is the first year of the recession. 
In the second year of the recession, they, like the meet full need states had to increase tuition more. And the others sort of started coming back to normal. And so I have no information to indicate that this is true, but the, here's my hypothesis. The problem with meet full need states, that prop, the irony of meet full, meet full need states is that if, you're, if you, have, you don't generate as much revenue if you increase tuition. If you increase tuition, a bunch of the people don't pay it. So my hypothesis, or our working hypothesis, is that the states didn't understand that. So when they raised tuition 10% and only got back 5% of additional revenue, like, ooh, we need more money. <laughs> so the next year, they had to increase rates again um, to sort of make it all work out. Like I said, I don't know that that's true, but that seems reasonable to me. Um, and then it took for them a little bit longer to get back to normal. All right, so, you know, SAT score send data. Um, let's just say the universe of data for everyone who took the SAT. Score sending is, so basically other people have used score sending in the past. We're thinking about applications. We're not the only ones to do this. We've got a bunch of demographics, uh, including the SAT scores, so we can control for SAT scores in these regressions. Um, the zip code of the SAT taker, that's how we figure out their family income. Um, so the cons of using these data is that not everyone takes the SATs, particular in, particularly in certain parts of the country where the ACT kind of rules. At the end of the day, like the edges of the country are a SAT land and the middle is ACT. Um, you know, later on we'll talk about like if we just, you know, focus on the states where it's mainly SAT, you, know, you get the same results. That's not that big of a deal. Just to give you some idea of the numbers that we're talking about, so we have 26.7 million high school seniors in these, uh, in these relevant cohorts. 11.6 um, million took the SAT, 8.5 million sent their scores to at least one school, and 2.6 million sent their scores to the state flagship. Okay, so a lot of people. National Student Clearinghouse data is what we use for enrollments. Um, national yeah, National Student Clearinghouse data is really good. <laughs> so uh, basically it has pretty much everybody. It's just the students, so we map, it's exactly the same kids. So we match the students from the College Board data to the National Student Clearinghouse data, so it's not like you know, we're getting one result for one set of kids and another result for a second set of kids, same kids throughout. Um, and the outcome is did you enroll in a state flagship? So 9% of total SAT centers enrolled in the flagship, 23% um, uh, wait, enrolled in SAT centers that enrolled in, what's wrong with that? A oh, flagship, the total SAT center, flagship SAT center. So if you sent your score to the flagship, 23% got it, or enrolled. Okay? Clarify my question. So on a previous slide, you showed us like Berkeley and a couple of universities. Are you doing some sample selection of those universities, or were they just like illust illustrated? Those are the four meatful need schools. Oh, I see. But you're going to be including like not meatful needs. Everybody's in there. Everybody's in there. Those are the meat. Those are the, yeah. So there's the meatful need and the not meatful need. We ended up we we dropped a few of the not meatful need because they did things like switch their policies in the middle. But there's 46 states that we're using. So four are in one and treatment group basically. And I see. So, so they're should, all there. Your sampling frame is going to be like and all of the state flagship schools and then partitioned by what they will be versus exactly. Excluded is going to be not flagship. Excluded is going to be private. Correct. Okay. It's 46 states, 46 universities. And there's one flagship per state. One flagship per state. So, like, we have tech, it's Austin, not AM. Um, in California, it's Berkeley. But one per state. It's whatever, um, like, iPads like, has a listing of what they think the flagships are. We just use them. Okay? All right. So, um, in terms of the econometrics, the identification strategy we're, we, uh, we want to focus on. But you know, if you just took a step back and thought for a second about like what's wrong in general with putting applications on the left-hand side and tuition on the right-hand side, is it, you know, and any you know estimating a demand, the shape of a demand curve, like that's problematic because you don't really know like you know what's driving the changes. Um, it could be that it could be that. Um, you know, demand is going down in the state, and the school has to reduce their tuition to sort of like get them back. Right, so that would be a problem. Um, the recession provides us with that exogenous shock. Right, the, the the recession is what sort of generates this blip up in tuition 
Uh, and I should have said this before. It's like, so now throughout, we're going to be using, so tuition is the price, not cost of attendance. And tuition is the price, not cost of attendance, because that's what gets advertised. Um, cost of attendance, we'll talk about what happens. Basically, uh, uh, the tuition is generally what's set at the state level. The rest of the package is often set at, at, the, at the institution level and sort of more like on a cost basis. Um, uh, the state budget shortfall is going to be affecting the tuition. Okay. So we want to focus on the recession. We think that that's coming a lot from the state budget crisis, crises. Um, we're going to hold constant these local labor market conditions. Um, and, you know, it's not, we, we try, it's like not obvious that that's a perfect experiment, but it seems like a pretty good one to us. Um, so what are the you know other sorts of things that we worried about is things like well what happens if in, in response to um, the state budget crisis they just stop spending money uh, the school Berkeley started spending less on the educational um, program right and then maybe the kids don't want to apply there because like Berkeley's no longer as good so we investigated that we didn't really see much else there I mean we could probably you know it's hard it's conceivable that there's other state factors that are affecting this outcome. Um, it's not obvious to us what those are. Um, so, I mean, basically, it's not an experiment. So, what are you going to do? Um, and again, we're going to use this IV strategy. We're going to, uh, you know, sort of almost like a specification check or something like that, just to go a little bit, you know, more detailed, focusing just on the budget conditions by instrumenting um, tuition with the unemployment rate. Okay. Everything else, I think, I've said. Here's the equations. So. Um, you know, so we're going to estimate these aggregate effects. It's just for everybody. How the, basically, what does the demand curve look like? Um, and so, score sends on the left-hand side, tuition log tuitions on the right-hand side, controlling for the unemployment rate lagged uh, a year from when they uh, sent their scores. Um, in the IV specifications, we're going to um, instrument the tuition with the year before that's unemployment rate, trying to get more narrowly at the budget crisis. And then in that for the triple difference thing with the with the you know the different chart incorporating the tuition uh, interaction, that's this model. So score sends are a function of uh, tuition, tuition interaction, like all of the interactions. Right. And here's and there's the triple and the triple um, the triple difference and the triple interaction term. Okay, the IV first stage is analogous. If you put those things into each of these boxes, basically what we're looking for, if you look back at the equations, the main effect, so the, the primary effect of tuition goes into the aid ineligible, doesn't meet full need. There's interaction of beta 2 that we're going to pick up in this box, and interaction beta 3 that we're going to pick up in this box, and all the interactions get picked up in this box. This is the one we care about. So the sticker shock hypothesis um, if people are responding rationally, that should be zero. If they're not, you know, I think the right way to think about this is like, if they're acting like everybody else, it'll be sort of like an average of these three boxes. Okay? So those are the two extremes. Obviously, you can have something in the middle. But that's what we're looking for. So here's what we get. In terms of just sort of the aggregate effect, what's the demand elasticity? Uh, if you have a 10% increase in tuition and fees, um, you get about a 2% reduction um, in applications. And that's, you notice, by the way, that's, that's almost exactly the same in both OLS and IV, sort of consistent with this notion that I, you know, IV doesn't really help all that much. It's sort of interesting. But, um, so here's what really what we're looking for, and our test is sticker shock. So we had an aggregate effect of about a 2% reduction. You know, 2%, 2.3, 1.6, 1.8. There's, there's standard errors around each of those numbers. Those are all the same. Like you are, is, there's no way you are going to find a way to distinguish those numbers. Um, that's consistent with sticker shock. These kids who should not have changed their behavior did in exactly the same way as everybody else did. Um, the IV specification is a little bit noisier because that's what you get when you do IV, but like you get the same sort of effects across the group. So it's like incorporating the fact that the standard errors are bigger. 
These are all the same. Okay? Sticker shock exists. That's the conclusion you get from this, these results. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of different specification checks that we did um, just to make sure that we're finding what we think we're finding. Uh, the one thing that you might worry about is like, you know, Michigan, Berkeley, UVA, and Chapel Hill. Hey, no, go ahead. I'm trying to think. Wouldn't you expect sticker shock to have different impacts depending on your family income? Yeah, that's that's what we're trying to get at. So that's okay. So sorry. The eight eligible are the, the low income kids. Right, but you found that it was all the same. Right. So. Um, Which would suggest that. They're responding to the. To the I, I, I'm setting aside the, the the rational piece, but like that doesn't meet financial needs line. You have sort of aid and eligible and aid eligible. They're both reducing their application rates in response to the the increase at relatively the same rate. Which price went up for them. Yeah, but you'd expect that the the consequence of the price would be different, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you? Or not? No. Why? Basically, they're all going to. They're, if you're in a state that doesn't meet full need, both. Um, to speak loosely, the rich kids and the poor kids both face, face a price increase. Right, but like, but if you're, but you have rich, might you have more, you have more flexibility to absorb that price increase. Yeah. Well, I should be so, expecting to be equally sensitive, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, so Phil, I, I think this doesn't like. You don't care whether, whether. Yeah. The aid eligible or the aid ineligible in the doesn't full yeah. meet states respond at the same rate or different rates, your whole thing goes zero. to like you need zero in the bottom right. Yeah. So so it could be like it is a little surprising, you know, well, that I, the aid out the lower well, income folks well, I, I guess my, my point is if all of the if all of the boxes go down by the same amount. Apply to a different school. But, but sure with Stephanie to, to get an actual actually your specific question, the idea of the the diff and diff or diff and diff and diff strategy is is you think that there's some natural change. Like you're by putting by stapling them all together and saying that these kids shouldn't have had a change whereas the other kids should have. A, another explanation is something else is just caused all of the reduction in admission or in reduction in rates just across the board. And and because because of the financial model, like in my head, the financial model would suggest that the rich kids would be differently sensitive than the poor kids to changing prices, but you're not finding that either, which tells me that maybe there's some other mechanism that's not having to do with finances that's changing the rate of, of, of applying. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I need to move along because I'm not going to shop. But like, at the end of the day, the true sticker hop shock hypothesis, as uh, Tom is saying, is looking for a zero here. The fact that, like, you know, that there's downward sloping demand curves for different groups, you know, you're saying maybe they should have different elasticities, but you can tell lots of different stories for what they are. It's like, on average, they look about the same. But if if you want to zero that, then why the diff and diff strategy at all? Like, what extra information are you hoping to get from the other boxes to increase your evidence for this? I mean, it's for that this box. one versus the rest. That's different. Never mind. So can I just ask, in your mind, what's the treatment here that the bottom right corner is getting that everyone else is not getting? Which one went up? It should not have affected their decision to attend college because they would not pay that price increase. I, I guess I'm just asking that question. They should not have responded to the tuition increase. But like all of those news articles that you showed at the beginning, everyone read them. So yeah. Yeah, that's just... is that included as part of the intervention? Like, wouldn't they have been affected by reading those things as well? That's the, that's the misperception. Okay. They thought that those price increases affected them, and they didn't. That's what, exactly it. Yeah, but, what they didn't realize is that headline was irrelevant for them. Yeah. I actually ask students all the time who come in, like, after Wellesley increases tuition 4%, and I have a low-income kid who's on financial aid, you know, telling me that, like, they can't afford it. And I have to tell them that, like, it's just not right. <laughs> it doesn't affect them. Okay. 
right, so here's what So, okay. UNC, UVA, Michigan, and Berkeley are not exactly a randomly selected group of flagships. They're all sort of high-ranking flagships. So what happens if we just take, um, I think it was SH, uh, flagships where average SAT scores are above a 1,200. So there's Wisconsin and Illinois and like lots of other good schools in there. Um, just focus on them, same thing. Um, you know, I just said this before, but you know, if you drop out the middle of the country where everyone takes the ACTs, that doesn't change the results. Omit California. Um, that doesn't change the results. Sometimes people worry about that. And then the me uh, using alternative measures of aid eligibility. So um, there's self-reported income, for instance, in the College Board data. We use that. Um, you know, we took different thresholds, not the 75,000, but maybe 100,000 or 50,000. Um, we tried that. We tried a bunch of different things that didn't really ever change the results. Um, using cost of attendance instead of tuition. In some sense, he, so the hypothesis that I'm drawing out there is that basically tuition is what matters and cost of attendance is in some sense noise. It's the, you know, because they're just adding on the cost of the room and board to the tuition. The tuition is back the shock. So if you were to do that, it's probably not surprising that if you add cost of attendance, you just get weaker results. It just turns it in a little, a little bit mushier. Okay? In terms of enrollments, we're estimating exactly the same models. You don't find any impact on enrollments at all. So why does that make sense? Well, basically, you know, these schools get more applications than they need. If they want to fill the same number of seats and they have fewer students, fewer, fewer, fewer applications, they can just change the standard a little bit. So we see that if we look at the average combined SAT score, it goes down by two points. Um, so it seems like they became less selective. And then the question becomes, well, where do they come? By the way, this is also not, no longer breaking up anything by groups because everybody looks the same. So this is just the aggregate effect. Um, so public flagship, that's basically what we just saw. So now the question becomes, well, where do they go instead? Um, and so the first thing that we do is suppose we just focus on uh, high achieving students, so SAT scores above the state median. Um, that, so the first one is like, what's the impact on public flagship enrollment? Well, basically, if they're being more selective, um, if those schools are, if those students are leaving to go elsewhere, that's we see a decrease in enrollment for those people. So again, we're seeing like, you know, the, the schools becoming less selective. Where do they go? Private four-year colleges. We see an increase in enrollment. So. Um, I have a clarifying question on this. So this is conditioned on they go. This is conditioned on they go somewhere. This is conditioned on they go somewhere. So these are like especially when you get to here. These kids are all going somewhere. So these are the high SAT kids. So so your analysis earlier is talking about how sticker shop chases people out of public schools and. According to this, suggests that it sends them to private schools. So it's not actually changing. Like, there's something odd about this picture because the prior picture shows that average SAT score is going down. down. Are, are other, are, but are SAT score, scores going up somewhere, or is it that people are leaving the whole market altogether, or leaving the whole school experience altogether? Because okay, so are we looking at a fixed population, or, or are people actually? Yeah, this is this is all students. Are all SAT senders? Um, all SAT senders that enroll in a college. In any college. Uh, I believe that's correct. Okay. No, no these are flagships. So for, and this this model here for SAT scores is just the kids who enroll in the flagship. Okay. Okay. A two point two point decline is pretty small. Yeah. I mean, you've got. 50,000 applicants, like you probably don't need to change, change the threshold that much, right? Yeah, so it's not like there's a dramatic change. Like it's basically there's no change. But I'm, I'm, trying to, all, I'm trying to understand. This, at the flagship. this is now high SAT score centers in general and where they enroll. And all these people are going to college. So, so the decrease, so, so the prior slide the decrease in SATs means that the high achievers went elsewhere. went elsewhere. So does that mean that the SAT scores at the private schools went up? I mean, you know, you're talking like conceivably, but you're talking about 
you know, you're talking about like a hand, relatively speaking, a handful of kids going to hundreds of schools. So like the other any at any individual school, you'd never see that. I mean, collectively, conceivably, but like this is you're talking about this. Well, you did collectively for the public flagship, so you could do public. Like we well, have 46 public flagships. You've got you know a thousand <laughs> other schools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you'd never be able to see the SAT Wait, what, score. What percent of students go to public flagship versus private? So it's so well, public flagships. Well, it's eighty percent go to public in general. So public flagships, uh, you can do the math. So like forty-six schools multiplied by twenty thousand students on average. Um, so you know, it's a it's a it's a significant fraction, and then you're talking about a two percentage point reduction. Right. I, I'm just saying, like, if, if that same number of students goes to a similarly sized population, it doesn't matter that it's spread across more schools, you would still see it. In the aggregate, we, we would, yeah. in theory, be able to see it. In any individual school is what I was saying. You'd never be able to see no, it. No, I wasn't asking that. Okay. So, Phil, we should give you a chance to yeah. hit your punchline. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, so, the bottom line here. Um, is so, you know, so taking a step back, like when I teach Econ 101, I talk about price discrimination. And when we get to the discussion about perfect price discrimination, I use financial aid as sort of, in theory, what should be a perfect example of that. Um, but, you know, one of the assumptions of price discrimination is perfect information. Right? That clearly does not exist. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, you know, in terms of that model, that just that just doesn't seem right. Here. Um, it's interesting to think about these general equilibrium effects. So basically, you know, if the schools are you know getting fewer applications, that also means they're able to, to ease their enrollment uh, admission standards and maintain their enrollment. Um, and the kids are going elsewhere, and where it seems like they're going, the high achieving kids are going to private schools. Um, in terms of policy interventions, if you th want to think about what, so what is this? So basically, what I think we've concluded from all this is sticker shock is real. Prices change, people don't respond appropriately. So, what does that say about policy interventions? In some sense, you know, the discussion about simplifying FAFSA, simplifying FAFSA is a great idea. It has significant potential to do good things, it doesn't solve this part of the problem. Um, you still need to be able to find ways to better communicate costs and real costs, what students are really paying. Um, and the fact that like for many of them, even with a simplified FAFSA, like if you can get the, you know, not to mention the fact that the FAFSA is only uh, 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 relevant at public institutions, not so much at public private institutions, we need to find ways to better communicate financial aid, to better communicate the prices that people are actually going to pay beyond simplifying fast. So that's not enough. I think I'll stop there. So, I so thanks, Phil. We, uh, I and others asked questions throughout. Yeah. And so I think we've, we've run out of time for uh, during the seminar for additional questions. But if folks have additional questions for Phil, um, we've got like a, a small reception out here for the next 15 minutes. Okay. And then Phil uh, will be coming back in to join the peer fellows in a, uh, in a small group discussion. But I just want to thank Phil and urge anybody who has uh, additional questions for Phil to catch him. Well, we actually, catering is running inexplicably late. Phone <laughs> well, call, so if you want to take five minutes for a couple extra questions, if anyone has them, we can interview. Yeah, all right. So, 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 so